Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And remember, I messed that up. And remember, context is everything. This is Context is Everything Media Network, and my name is John Michael. I'm going to be guiding you through What's Under Your Hood, episode 13? I don't know how that works when I'm doing five days a week and this is Monday. But here we are. World History, 2001 published. I'm reading through this because context is everything. And I'm rebuilding my historical context by going through the history of the world, you know? So I'm going to read this. We're on section... uh, section uh, three of chapter three and we're in india indus valley we talked about religions in the indus valley um i have something i want to talk about regarding those religions in the indus valley but let's let's get back into the book and i'll find a moment probably during the review at the end of this chapter which will be in uh, three days on wednesday or thursday whichever one happens um, but five days a week, we're reading this 2001 textbook here, uh, building my context and also uh, you know, <laughs> creating some quality, wholesome content for the folks back home. Thank you for joining me. This is John Michael, Context is Everything Media Network. What's Under Your Hood, episode 13. Let's dive back in. Was there a homework question last time? Well, just like in class, sometimes you neglect to review the homework and it's up to the one kid at the end of class to say we had homework and then you say right and you collect it all and that kid's a pariah amongst his peers who didn't do their homework and probably against the peers who did their homework because you're costing them another day of no homework because uh, rather than going over that assignment, you know, it doesn't matter. Section 3, Chapter 3. Early civilizations in China. Oh, so we're headed eastward still. Setting the scene. In very ancient times... What? Setting the scene. Early civilizations in China. In very ancient times, relates a Chinese legend... Floodwaters rose to the top of the highest hills. You, by you, a hard-working official, labored for 13 years to drain waters. This is you. I open the passage for the streams throughout the nine provinces and conducted them to the sea. I deepened channels and canals and conducted them to the streams. Schwing, Book of History. That's the quote. While taming the rivers, you, the speaker, did not once go home to see his wife and children. As a reward for his selfless selfless efforts, he later became ruler of China. The legend of you offers insight into early China. The ancient Chinese valued the ability to control floodwaters and to develop irrigation systems for farming. The legend also shows how highly the Chinese prized the devo- uh, devotion to duty. How highly they prized devotion to duty. That's what it was said. That's what it said. Both of these values played a key role in the development of Chinese civilizations. The geography of China. Very large, right? The ancient Chinese called their land Zhongyao. Zhong, no, Zhongguao. Zhongguao. The Middle Kingdom, Zhongguao. China was the most isolated of the civilizations you have studied so far. Long distances and physical barriers separated from Egypt, the Middle East, and India. This isolation contributed to the Chinese belief that China was the center of the earth and its sole source of civilization. Geographic barriers. These are important. To the west and the southwest of China, high mountain ranges, the Tian Shan, the Himalayas,
The brutal deserts blocked the easy movement of people. To the southeast, thick jungles divided China from Southeast Asia. The north lay forbidding desert, the Gobi. To the east, the vast Pacific Ocean rolled endlessly. Despite formidable barriers, the Chinese did, did have contact with outside world. They traded with neighboring people, and in time, China's goods reached the Middle East and beyond. More often, though, the outsiders whom the Chinese encountered were nomadic invaders. To the Chinese, these nomads were barbarians who did not speak Chinese and lacked the skills and achievements of the settled society. Nomads conquered China from time to time. Weird. But they were usually absorbed into the advanced Chinese civilization. What a strange sentence. Nomads conquered China from time to time, but they were usually absorbed into the advanced Chinese civilization, so that means they didn't conquer them. Right? Main regions of China. As the Chinese expanded over the enormous area, their empire became... As the Chinese expanded over an enormous area, their empire came to include many regions with a variety of climates and landforms. The Chinese heartland lay along the east coast, and the valleys of the Hanghe, Huanghe, or Yellow River, and the Yangtze. In ancient times as today, these fertile farming regions supported the largest popula populations. Then, as now, the rivers provided water for irrigation and served as transportation routes. Beyond the heartland are the outlying regions of Shangjiang, Mongolia, and Manchuria. The first two regions have a harsh climates and rugged terrain. Until recent times, they were mostly occupied by nomads and subsistence farmers. Not a vocabulary word. I would expect subsistence farmer to be a vocabulary word. A farmer who makes what they will eat to survive. Subsistence is a word that means what requires for life. So they farm to provide for themselves. Subsistence farmers. All three outlying regions played a key role in China's history. Nomads repeatedly attacked and plundered Chinese cities. At other times, powerful Chinese rulers conquered or made allowance, alliances with other people of their regions. China also extended its influence over the Himalayan region of Tibet, which the Chinese called Shangzang, or Shizang. What's that? River of Sorrows. Chinese history began with Huanghe Valley, where Neolithic people learned to farm. As in other places, the need to control the flow of the river through the large water projects probably led to the rise of a strong central government. The Huanghe got its name from the Laos, L-O-E-S-S, -S. Laos, uh, or fine uh, wind-blown yellow soil. The Huanghe got its name from Laos, or the fine yellow wind-blown soil that it carries eastwards from Siberia and My Mongolia. Long ago, Huanghe earned its bitter nickname, River of Sorrows. As Los settles to the river bottom, it rises the water level. Racist. Chinese peasants labored constantly to build and repair dikes and that kept the river from overflowing. Of the dikes, uh, if the dikes broke, floodwaters burst over the land. Such disasters destroyed crops and brought mass starvation, fear of floods, and reflecting 
in, uh, and reflected in Chinese writing. The character or written symbol for misfortune is this. And it represents a river with blockage that caused flooding. China under Shang is the next section. About 1650 BC, a Chinese people called the Shang gained control of the corner of northern China. Along the Huang He, the Shang dynasty dominated this region until 1027 BC. During the Shang okay. period... I found this on the web for region until 1027 BC. Check it out. I gotta turn Siri off. I really don't like that. I really got to turn Siri off. I don't like that. I don't know if you can hear that. I feel like there's probably some sort of a compressor built into or an equalizer or something like that built into the speaker system in the MacBook that would tell you don't hear what we output. Only hear with the microphone. Only hear the ambient. Don't hear anything that's coming from the, uh, from the computer itself. There's probably some sort of... Uh, like EQ thing, like the high pass or something like that, isolates the frequencies. But Siri just heard me ask a question as I was reading, and it answered it. If you didn't hear that on the computer as you're listening to this on YouTube, that's uh, interesting and a product of technology. Either way, during the Shang period, Chinese civilizations first took shape. Shang. Ooh, pottery. Government. Archaeologists have uncovered large palaces and rich tombs of Shang rulers. Shang kings led other noble warriors in battle. From their walled capital city at Anyang, A-N-Y-N-G, they emerged to drive off nomads from northern steppes and deserts. Steppe is a land formation. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what it is. And it's not a vocabulary word. In Shang tomb, archaeologists discovered. In one Shang tomb, archaeologists discovered the burial place of Fu Hao, wife of Shang of the Shang King Wu Ding. Artifacts show that she owned land and helped to lead the large army against invaders. This evidence suggests that noble women had considerable status during the Shang period. Shang kings probably controlled only a small area. Loyal princes, nobles governed loyal princes and noble govern and nobles governed most of the land. They were likely the heads of important clans or groups of families who claimed a common ancestor. Thus, Shang China probably more closely resembled the city-states of Sumer than the civilized government ruled by Egyptian pharaohs. Interesting. This thing about uh, women having power is an interesting thought. I think that that's an interesting thing. Let me look back at that. In one Shang tomb, archaeologists discovered the burial place of Fu Hao, wife of Shang King Wu Ding. Artifacts show that she owned land and helped to lead a large army against invaders. This evidence suggests that noble women had considerable status during the Shang period. Does it suggest that? I mean, maybe it does. But that's one piece of evidence alone. One piece of evidence alone can give you a hint about how a society was built and how it stood up. But one piece of evidence alone, I don't think you can really confidently make a sweeping generalization that ancient China had high status for women in the noble sense. Maybe they did, and maybe this evidence is enough. But I would say I need to see a little bit more evidence rather than one sentence about it to be convinced that that's the way it was. And I'm probably not going to be convinced because um, 
this book itself actually doesn't have footnotes in it. So I don't know what their source is. That's an interesting thing. Social classes. Shang's society mirrored that in other early civilizations. Alongside royal families was the noble class warrior. Shang warriors used leather armor, bronze weapons, and horse-drawn chariots. Uh, the chariots may have come from Asian people, other Asian peoples. Early Chinese cities supported a class of artisans and merchants. Artisans produced goods for nobles, including bronze weapons, silk robes, and jade jewelry. Merchants exchanged food and crafts made by local artisans for salt, cowrie shells, and other goods not found in northeastern China. Peasant life. Most people in Shang, China were peasants. They clustered together in farming villages. Many lived in thatch-roofed pit houses whose earthen floors were dug several feet below the surrounding ground. Peasants led grueling lives. All family members worked in the fields using stone tools to prepare the ground for planting or to harvest grain. They were not in the fields. Peasants had not had to repair the dikes. If war broke out between noble families, men had to fight alongside their lords. Oh, the lords would fight. Hmm. Religious beliefs. Do I look tired? I think the lighting isn't great. Well, I'll deal with that tomorrow. The lighting is not great. I think I need a light over here. I switched the light. Uh, I prefer to have light up here so that it like hits here. Because otherwise it looks like I have bags under my eyes, which I kind of do, but not that bad. Religious beliefs. In Shang times, Chinese, the Chinese had developed complex religious beliefs, many of which continued to be practical for thousands of years. They prayed to many gods and na uh, nature spirits. Chief among them were Shang Di, the mother goddess who brought plants and animals to earth. The king was seen as the link between the people uh, and Shang Di. Gods as great as Shang Di, the Chinese believed, would not respond to pleas from mere mortals. Only the spirit of the great mortals, such as the ancestors of the king, could get their ear of the gods. Thus the prayers of rulers and nobles to their ancestors were thought to serve the community as a whole, ensuring good harvests or victory in war. At first, only the royal family and other nobles had ancestors important enough to influence the gods. Gradually, other classes shared in these rituals. The Chinese called the spirits of their ancestors to bring good fortune to the family. To honor their ancestors' spirits, uh, they offered sacrifices of food and other necessities. When Westerners reached China, they mistakenly called the practices ancestor worship rather than like uh, god worship. They called it ancestor worship. That's kind of interesting. Systems of writing. The ancient Chinese also developed a system of writing. Writing like religious beliefs was an early development that continued to influence cultures in China. Throughout history, this system has been used both pictographs, ideographs, signs that express thoughts and idea, and ideas. Ideographs are signs that express thoughts and ideas. Consulting the ancestors. Some of the oldest examples of Chinese writing are on oracle bones. The animal bones of or turtle shells, Shang priests wrote questions addressing the god to the gods or spirits of the an an ancestor. Priests then heated the bone or shell until it cracked. By interpreting the pattern of cracks, they provided answers or advice from the ancestors. The difficult study. Written Chinese took shape almost 4,000 years ago. Over time, it evolved. Over time, it evolved. Um, to include tens of thousands of characters. Each character 
uh, represents, represented a word or idea and was made up of a number of different strokes. In recent years, the Chinese have simplified their characters, um, but Chinese remains one of the most difficult languages to learn. Students must still memorize up to 10,000 characters to read the newspaper. By contrast, languages based on an alphabet, such as English or Arabic, contain only two dozen or so symbols representing basic sounds. Not surprisingly, in earlier times, only the well-to-do could afford the years of study needed to master the skill of reading and writing. Working with brush and ink, Chinese scholars turned calligraphy, or fine handwriting, into an elegant art form, a force of unity, Zhao Dynasty. The, in, 19, uh, in 1027 BC, a battle-hardened uh, Zhao, Zhao people marched out of their kingdom to western frontier to overthrow Shang. They set up Zhao Dynasty, which lasted until 256 BC, the Mandate of Heaven. To justify their rebellion against the Shang, the Zhao promoted the idea of Mandate of Heaven, or the divine right of rule. The cruelty of the last Shang king, they declared, had so outraged... Wow, this is a long section. Not going to finish it. So outraged the gods that it set ruin on him. The gods then passed the mandate of heaven to the Zhao, who treated the multitudes of people well. Chinese later explain, expanded the idea of the mandate of heaven to explain the dynasty cycle, or the rise and fall of dynasties. As long as the dynasty provided good government, it enjoyed the mandate of heaven. If rulers became weak or corrupt, the Chinese believed that heaven would withdraw its support. So I guess that's all the time we have today. Context is everything. What's under your hood? Episode 13. The Zhao, the Shang, the Himalayas, and China. Ancient civilizations with a complex written language system that is unrivaled to this day. John Michael, Context is Everything Media Network. Have a wonderful evening. And remember, context is everything.